Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Alana, for that introduction. Um, so yes, today I will be talking about dopamine agonists, MALB inhibitors, and more. So before I start, I just wanted to bring your attention to just a correction that I made on one of my slides for those who've attended the last webinar on levodopa. So on slide 17 in the levodopa PDF, I just wanted to add the world transdermal therapy to that. So for some people, they might be started on duodopa therapy if their existing medications, even with the modifications and optimization, doesn't control or manage the motor complications such as motor fluctuations or dyskinesias. In some cases, um, you know, duodopa might be used. So if you want to download the revised slides, they're on the PSBC website under resources and services. So to start with my presentation, I'm going to start with just a quick recap and an introduction. So again, I just want to remind people that levodopa is the most effective medication for treating the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. However, not all individuals will be started on levodopa. In some cases, um, medications from other families might be used instead to manage BD, and those same medications can then also serve as add-on therapy to levodopa in later stages of PD. For treatment initiation, um, there is no designated medication. There's no one medication that is recommended every time for the initial treatment of PD. And there's actually instead different factors that may influence which medication can be selected instead to help manage the symptoms of PD early on. Um, these factors include such things as the severity of the symptoms. So how severe are your symptoms? Like how much does it affect your everyday life from the different tasks that you need to do? Um, another thing might be which hand does it affect? Does it affect your dominant hand or your non-dominant, right? Because that may play a big role as well. In some cases too, like, well, actually rather in most cases, you have to think about, are you still working? Does it impact your ability to work? Does it impact your ability to exercise, engage in your hobbies and the things that you like to do? And what's the effect of your motor symptoms on your activities of daily living? So just, you know, getting ready for the day, bathing, brushing your teeth, brushing your hair, you know, prepping meals, um, buttoning up your shirt, things like that. How do your PD symptoms affect those tasks? And of course, we have to think about often costs as well for some people because some of these medications can be quite expensive, right? So things like that, those type of preferences and are things that we have to think about. But at the end of the day, I really do want to highlight that it is a shared decision making process. Like both you and your neurologist will have to discuss on what may be best for you. Um, would it be a dopamine agonist? Would it be levodopa? Would it maybe be a MAO-B inhibitor? Um, so many different factors come into play. Like, what would you do, for example, in the case where you might find that it's a tremor in your non-dominant hand and you feel like your ability to exercise is not being impaired? Is it really true that when you do exercise, for example, are you sure that it's not holding you back from having a full, vigorous, you know, productive and successful workout. Like those things really do have to be examined. So that's where the decision making process comes in. And that's where the discussion comes on about the different factors that you have to take into consideration when deciding which type of therapy might work best for you. So before I start, um, I want to go over some terminology. Some of these terms I've used in my last presentation, but I'm going to do a recap again just because I will be using them again. So I'll be talking about wearing off, the on-off phenomenon, and dyskinesia. Um, like I said before from the last presentation, um, motor complications is comprised of wearing off and on-off phenomenon. So those are the motor fluctuations. And then we have dyskinesia as well, which makes up the motor complications. So I'll go over that. And then I'm also going to try to explain just what a receptor, an agonist, and an antagonist are. So to go over again, motor fluctuations. So 
Um, the first one would be a common one that a lot of you might experience or some of you might experience is wearing off or the end of dose effect. So you notice that, for example, when you first started treatment, you might find that, you know, your levodopa, carbidopa, 100 over 25, the one tablet three times a day, you found that, you know, it provided you that nice sustained continual coverage. But as time has passed, you might find that the effects of the medication, for example, they're beginning to fade a little bit sooner. So instead of the five to six, you might find that, oh, now it's only decreasing and I'm only finding that I'm on or, you know, my symptoms are managed for about three to four hours and then the effects feel like they're beginning to fade. So essentially in cases like that, you find that the PD symptoms are returning back before your next scheduled dose. In this case, for example, levodopa dose, but of course, wearing off can occur in other cases as well, right? But I just, I'm just i sorry, I'm just using levodopa as my example from last time. And then you have the on-off phenomenon, which are the unpredictable fluctuations between the PD symptoms from being controlled. So you're feeling on and ready to go. You're able to, you know, do tasks, do your errands at a good pace, do things around the house at a good pace. You're not feeling slow and rigid. And you can fluctuate to a point where you're feeling poorly controlled or you're feeling like you're in an off state where you're feeling slow and rigid again. So those fluctuations between the two, um, they do not relate to the timing of your medication. So in this case, it could occur possibly 45 minutes or 50 minutes after taking a dose. And usually those times you're feeling that you're, you should be on, but in the on-off phenomenon, you might feel that you're off because they are unpredictable. And then we go into the dyskinesias. Dyskinesia, so another form of another motor complication. So in this case, um, they could be irregular, irregular, uncontrollable, and involuntary movement. They can affect different parts of the body, and they can also spread. So some people might find that it occurs in you know, the legs or the arms or the trunk of their body or their face. Um, and it can also be in the form sorry, um, with dyskinesias, they can actually be in two forms, like two forms make up dyskinesia. So they can be um, in the form known as chorea. So chorea, um, one of the best ways I think I saw for you to think of chorea is think of it as choreography. So more kind of dance-like, fluid-like movements. So they can present as wriggling or head bobbing, fidgeting, twisting, and squirming movements, where the other form is dystonia, where you have the involuntary muscle contractions that can result in abnormal or sustained posture. So those painful spasms or those painful cramps or that turl, toe curling that you might get in the morning for some of you that you experience early in the morning before you've had your dose of levodopa, for example, and then you find that they start going away after your medications kick in. So that would be an example of dystonia. And of course, just to remind you again, that with dyskinesia, it is not a symptom of Parkinson's disease, but a side effect of some of the medications used to treat PD. Okay, so I made up this diagram to show what a, what a receptor is, an agonist, and an antagonist. So with a receptor, receptors are structures that are found on the surfaces of cells, and they bind to molecules. So in this case, it could be an agonist or an antagonist. And essentially what happens is the binding of these molecules relays messages, essentially telling the cells what to do. So in this case, for example, an agonist is a molecule that can bind to these receptors activating it and producing an effect. So think of a dopamine agonist, which I'll go into. It's binding to a receptor and producing an effect such as allowing you to move and to do the things that you need to do and to exercise and to prep meals and to go and yeah, hobbies work, right? And then we have the antagonist, which would also bind to the same receptor, except in this case, it does not activate and it does not produce an effect. So in this case, an antagonist actually blocks the activation up from an agonist, right? It blocks the receptor site. So another way you can think about this is a lock and key. So in this case, an agonist, the lock, the key, and then the lock being the receptor, when you 
put it in, you activate it, you get an effect. But if you're using the wrong key on the lock, then nothing's going to happen would be another way to think about it. So to start off with the dopamine agonists, um, the mechanism of action is they act on dopamine receptors. So they mimic dopamine. Some examples of dopamine agonists include Pramipexol, Ropinerol, Rotigotine, which is the transdermal option, which I'll be talking about a little bit more, Bromocryptine, and Apomorphine. Rotigotine is a transdermal patch, so it is an alternative to oral therapies. And with this patch, they are applied once a day, so approximately every 24 hours. For some people, um, they may find that it helps just improve with adherence. It helps them remember because they're only using it once a day. However, with the transdermal options, um, application sites reactions may occur. So they may be mild to moderate in intensity, but that's where the importance of switching the application sites is important. So the same site they recommend by the manufacturer recommends rather that the same site should be avoided for 14 days. And if you ever, if you do decide to go on the new patch or the doctor thinks it's an option, um, in the box it actually comes out with a little pamphlet um, highlighting the areas that you can apply. So it includes like the stomach, the thigh, the hip, the side of the body between the ribs and the pelvis, also known as the flank, the shoulder, or the upper arm and in some cases you think 14 sites like how am I going to have that variety so I don't use the same site again essentially you can you know move down the body go from right to left so that you you can avoid you know the same site or a site for 14 days um, with the dopamine agonist um, there's no good data that states one dopamine agonist is better than another at managing motor symptoms. However, with that being said, Pramipexol, Ropinerol, and Rotigotine are preferred over Bromocryptine. And the reason for that is because Bromocryptine is associated with the risk of causing pleuropulmonary and cardiac valve, cardiac valve fibrosis. So um, pleuropulmonary essentially affects the lungs and it's essentially scarring of the lungs, like scar tissue formation. And of course, if you have scarring of the lungs or of, you know, the membrane that lines the chest cavity, which the lungs are in, then of course you're not getting that same movement of oxygen, right? You're not, it affects your breathing. And then in the case of cardiac valve fibrosis, essentially it's a remodeling of the cardiac valve. So it impedes the ability for the blood to move the way it's supposed to around the heart and just through the chamber. So if there's a thickening, for example, of the cardiac valve, of course, it's going to affect how blood moves around. So in cases like that, if someone is started on bromocryptine, the, it's recommended that possibly a chest x-ray or a heart echocardiogram and some other tests are run just at the beginning before treatment is initiated just to make sure things are looking okay and then throughout treatment if someone is on bromocryptine to continuing with this monitoring just to make sure there are no changes so with the dopamine agonist um, they are the second most effective class of medications used to treat the motor symptoms of pd after levodopa because like i said for the last presentation presentation levodopa is your most effective but dopamine does come in second in that regard at managing motor symptoms uh, the thing with the dopamine agonists is they can be used as monotherapy so they can be uh, used alone in early pd to help manage symptoms but they can also be used as an adjunct or an add-on to levodopa to help manage the motor complications in later pd so like i said motor complication comprised of the motor fluctuations so the wearing off or the on-off phenomenon and then you have the dyskinesia so dopamine agonists can be used in later therapy to help treat that, or later PT to help treat those symptoms. Um, so essentially with the dopamine agonist then, if they're helping treat wearing off, then you're helping decrease that time where you might feel that your, you know, your symptoms are coming back. So you're reducing your off time and essentially increasing your on time. Um, and in also cases of helping 
treat the dyskinesias, it's once you get the dopamine agonist to a clinically effective dose, which I'll explain in a little bit, um, it may allow you to decrease the levodopa dose, which may help decrease the dyskinesias. Because like I mentioned before in my last webinar with the levodopa, right, the side effect is the dyskinesia. So if you are able to reduce the levodopa dose after starting a dopamine agonist, hopefully you'll reduce the dyskinesias. So it's one of those things that when you are, when a dopamine agonist is added to therapy, those are the adjust adjustments that the neurologist will have, or the movement disorder specialist will have to, you know, think about and consider and help you through. And again, like I said, um, Pramipex, Solbropinerol, and Rotigotine are the recommend or preferred options to help treat the motor complications as well instead of the bromocryptine because of the side effects that I mentioned in the pleuropulmonary fibrosis as well as the cardiac, cardiac valve fibrosis. So another thing that often the neurologists or the physicians will think about when they're initiating therapy. So with the dopamine agonists, they are associated with less motor complications, so the wearing off, so less wearing off, less on-off phenomenon and dyskinesias than levodopa. So if you were to say, for example, if you were to do a head-to-head -head of, you know, starting levodopa and motor complications, in like about five years, motor, comp motor complications will be more common with the levodopa and not so much the dopamine agonist in that case. And they will find that often motor complications occur earlier with levodopa than the dopamine agonist. However, with that being said, even though dopamine agonists are associated with less motor complications, they're associated with more side effects. So some side effects of the dopamine agonist include nausea, orthostatic hypotension, so it's that lightheadedness that one may experience when they're standing up from a sitting or a lying down position. Um, some may experience drowsiness, leg edema, edema is swelling, sudden sleep attacks. So with sudden sleep attacks, um, after looking into this further, sudden sleep attacks, when I was reading a study, they can come on with or without warning. So with warning in that case would be what they found is yawning or if you're just closing your eyelids or feeling like there is a decrease in mental alertness or just suddenly some excessive drowsiness before the sleep attack occurs. That is what they found would be considered a warning. Whereas of course, no warning is you just suddenly fall asleep with none of those symptoms of you know sleepiness before that. In one study that they did that I found um, it looked like about 6.0% of patients reported having sleep attacks with or without warning. And when they actually did an analysis of the dopamine agonist, they found that about 5.3% of individuals of individuals on dopamine agonist therapy by itself experienced sleep attacks. They also found that in some cases, patients that were on just levodopa therapy also experienced sleep attacks, but that was lower at 2.9% because essentially dopaminergic therapy, so any medications that involve dopamine can cause sleep attacks, but with the dopamine agonist, it, there is more sleep attacks with that class of family than there that class of drugs versus the levodopa. So it's definitely more prevalent amongst the dopamine agonists. But with that being said, you know, from this study, 5.3%. And in cases where um, a person was on levodopa and one dopamine agonist, they found that about 7.3% had sleep attacks. So still, you know, low, but it's something that we still always have to counsel on and the physician would have to talk about. So I think my main counseling point here in this case right, is that you would never drive when you're drowsy. Like, you just don't drive when you're drowsy. And in the cases where you are driving and you do feel drowsy, the best thing to do in that case would just pull over to where it's safe and just get out of your car and maybe just walk around and just wake yourself up before you get back onto the road and start driving again would be a recommendation if in that case because you're already on the road. But of course, not 
turning on your car and moving until you feel that you're ready to do so and you feel like you're alert enough to do so. Um, we're going to talk also about side effects again is just hallucinations and then impulse control disorders. So when we're talking about impulse control disorders, essentially it's you know, compulsive or excessive gambling, um, excessive shopping, um, binge eating, or hypersexuality. Um, according to the Parkinson's disease guidelines, um, impulse control disorders can are estimated to occur in about 20% of individuals treated with dopamine agonists. So it's definitely always a counseling point for sure, which I will go into the next slide as well. So talking about counseling points now that we hear about the side effects, um, when I when we talk about counseling points, and especially when it comes to treatment initiation, for those who have been started on a dopamine agonist or those um, who might be started in the future, often you will see that you are started at a lower dose, a lower initial dose, and then gradually increase to a clinically effective dose. And that's because at low doses, a dopamine agonist may have less benefit, but you'll still experience those adverse or those side effects. So by starting at a lower dose, it allows you to get used to the side effects and helps minimize side effects and allows you to build up a tolerance to those side effects. So that when in a week's time, approximately seven days, for example, with like Premapexel, when you're going, you might start off at zero, 0.125 milligrams three times a day in a week or so it might be 0 0.25 milligrams three times a day and then after that get up to a dose in seven days or so another increase to 0 0.5 milligrams three times a day so that it just allows for your body to adjust um, and with that being said um, the drowsiness and the nausea are often the ones that people might experience first when they're just being started so it's really important just to allow your body to kind of build up a tolerance to those effects because they can definitely affect your quality of life. Um, and in regards to the side effects, so um, it's important when possible that um, not only the individual with Parkinson's, but also family members, care partners, and or caregivers should also be made aware, aware of the potential, potential side effects, right? Um, and in this case, for example, if impulse control disorders develop, the dopamine agonist will either be decreased or discontinued by the physician. I used impulse control disorders in this case, but of course it's any side effects, like if someone's having sleep attacks or if there's anything like that edema or that swelling that I talked about, often that will be revisited by the specialist. And in cases it'll be discontinued or decreased, it really depends on the circumstance because obviously in cases where you are decreasing something to take care of one side effect, then you might get less motor management of your PD symptoms, right? So it's one of those things that it's different for everybody and really just depends on what after, you know, consultation with the physician after their analysis, what would be the most appropriate option. Now I'm going to talk about apomorphine. So apomorphine is a subcutaneous injection also, of course, a dopamine agonist, and it is used in ind individuals that are experiencing off episodes, even after their medications that they're using to treat their PD has been optimized. So in this case, for example, in cases where patients are on levodopa and they're on other medications like dopamine agonists, but they're still experiencing those off episodes, they're, they're experiencing wearing off and the unpredictable on-off fluctuations. In those individuals, that's where apomorphine might be considered an option. With that being said, apomorphine is only used during an off episode. So you think of it as a rescue medication. It's a rescue medication, so it's only used intermittently. So um, it's an injection that you would use inter intermittently just under the skin, subcutaneous, just into the fatty tissue underneath. And the onset of action is approximately 10 minutes and the effects last for approximately 90 minutes. Um, going forward, we're going to move on to our next class of medications. So I'm going to be talking about the MAO-B inhibitors. So the MAO-B inhibitors, um, their mechanism of action is they help prevent the dopamine degradation or the breakdown in the brain. And by doing so, they help increase the concentration of dopamine in the brain. So um, some examples would be risagiline, safinamide, and selegiline. 
With the MAO B inhibitors, they can be used as monotherapy, so they can be used alone to treat the mild symptoms in early PD. So when we go back to the different classes, remember how levodopa was your most effective, and then you had your dopamine agonist, and then I would say you have your MAO B inhibitors. So they might be used in mild disease or early PD because they can help just treat the mild symptoms, right? But there is some benefit for some people, depending on where they are. Um, with that being said, the options for that, for the monotherapy or just used alone treatment for early PD would be risagiline and selegiline. Risagiline, though, can also be used as an adjunct or an add-on to levodopa and later PD to decrease off time. And then with safinamide, it can also be used as add-on therapy, but it can only be used on as add-on therapy and not used as monotherapy or used alone to treat mild PD or early PD like risagiline or selegiline can. And so you can see here that risagiline and safinamide help essentially if you're helping reduce off time, then you're helping reduce or helping with the wearing off symptoms. So that fading effect that you might get, you know, as time goes on between the doses where if you're reducing that time that you're off, then you're decreasing your off time, and then you're increasing your on time. So some side effects of the MAO-B inhibitors include insomnia. So generally when I'm counseling this medication or this class of medications, I'm just like earlier in the day would be best. So with breakfast or maybe before lunch, depending on the regimen that the individual started on, in cases where it is selegiline and it is dosed twice a day, it's recommend, and in cases where someone might be experiencing insomnia, then I would suggest see if you can take, you know, baby, for example, your first dose of selegiline, you know, 7.30 or 8 or whenever you get up and maybe take your second dose if you can just early afternoon so it doesn't affect your ability to sleep at night. Uh, Mal B inhibitors can also cause side effects, hallucinations, nausea, the dyskinesias, because in the case where you are essentially preventing the breakdown of dopamine in the brain, right, then the chances of dyskinesia can occur because now you have more dopamine. So of course, in cases like that, in an example where risagiline or safinamide, if it's used as an add-on, it also might be one of those things where possibly a levodopa dose increase, but it's one of those things where every circumstance is different because again, with side effects, not everyone experiences certain side effects, right? So it's just things that we have to really do look at. And then orthostatic hypotension. So it's that lightheadedness when you're going from a lying down or a sitting down position to standing upright is common with risagiline or selegiline. But um, the one thing is they found that with safinamide, a high blood pressure might be more common instead of orthostatic hypotension. So lightheadedness. Okay, so I brought up this question because I've received this question in the past. And the question is, can taking a medication such as risagiline inhibit the breakdown of tyramine, leading to high levels of tyramine in the body, causing a severe increase in blood pressure? So um, just a FYI, so what tyramine is, is tyramine is a compound that can be found in high amount in certain foods, such as sauerkraut, aged cheeses, and cured meats. So the reason for this is often um, if you do a search or, you know, you'll hear about drug interactions, you'll hear one about MAO inhibitors and tyramine. And that's why this question comes up. And to answer that question, I'm just going to have to explain um, essentially what MAO is. So MAO stands for monoamine oxidase. And this enzyme, which is responsible for essentially its job is to deactivate neurotransmitters such as dopamine once they have done their jobs, just so that they can't continually bind to receptors. Because what happens if dopamine, for example, this, you know, if it continually, continually binds to a receptor, then essentially it causes a continual state of excitation, which is not what is intended, right? You need to give a the, essentially the brain cells a break so that they can do other things. You can't continually excite them. So it's important for these neurotransmitters to be 
broken down just to prevent the constant stimulation. So in our body, we have two monoamine oxidase subtypes. We have the MAO A and MAO B. So when they are talking about that drug interaction between MAO inhibitors and tyramine, they're often talking about those inhibitors that might be not selective. So in that case, they would inhibit, for example, MAO A and MAO B. In the case of Parkinson's disease, it's MAO B that's being inhibited. So in that case, when you are just inhibiting mal b you still have mal a which can break down for example tyramine right so with that being said when mal b inhibitors are used at a rec at recommended doses for pd dietary tyramine restriction is not required because you have that selective blocking or inhibition but with that being said um, you know, the drug monograph, so the drug handout for Azelect or Rosagiline states that foods with very high amounts of tyramine, so greater than 150 milligrams, should be avoided due to the potential of causing severe increase in blood pressure, or they call it hypertensive emergency or crisis, right? Um, so essentially hypertensive, high blood pressure, and in this case, because of the interaction, the potential of an increase, a severe increase in blood pressure even when taken with recommended doses of azelect. But the one thing I really want to note is with the tyramine, 150 milligrams is a lot, and most foods don't contain 150 milligrams. Of course, though, with that being said, if you eat certain tyramine-rich foods, so say, for example, you're eating a lot of blue cheese or in addition to you know salami and pepperoni, and if you're eating excessive amounts, of course, then you can possibly reach those type of levels, right? So I always tell people, you don't necessarily have to eliminate, but it's just something that you wanna be mindful of and you wanna minimize and you just really wanna think of moderation in, that, in this case, if you are taking something like a MAO-B inhibitor. So the next class of medications I'm going to talk about are the COMT inhibitors. So um, with the COMT inhibitors, their mechanism of action is they help reduce levodopa clearance before it gets into the brain. So to um, go on about levodopa, right, for my first webinar, I said the levodopa was, can either be combined with carbidopa or bensericide to help prevent their clearance or um, you know, outside before they get into the brain, so into the periphery. It helps, carbidopa and bensericide would help prevent that breakdown. But with that being said, of course, there is still going to be, you know, some breakdown of that levodopa out in the periphery, even when combined, right? So that's where the COMT inhibitors come in, because COMT is um, essentially an enzyme that's found out, on the, out in the periphery. So in that case, when you inhibit that enzyme, it allows for more levodopa to get into the brain. So that's why it's so important for uh, intacopone, the COMT inhibitor, to be taken, le taken with levodopa because its role is to extend the duration of action of levodopa by allowing it to get into the brain and reducing the clearance before it gets to the brain. Uh, with that being said, there is a combination tablet of intacopone, levodopa, and carbidopa, also known as Stilevo, available. So with the COMT inhibitors, um, they're used to help manage wearing off. So that fading that you might feel or the wearing off of the symptoms, the COMT inhibitors can help with that, help with that because they're allowing for more of the medication to reach the brain, and they can decrease this off time by about 1 to 1.5 hours per day. The thing with COT inhibitors is in cases where they are added to someone's regimen and that person is starts to experience dyskinesia, the levodopa dosage may need to be reduced in that situation. Of course, it's a discussion to have with a physician on how to go about doing that because, of course, every case would be different. 
Side effects of the COT inhibitors include nausea, uh, diarrhea for some people that it should pass and it should go away with time. And in some cases, people might experience urine discoloration, urine discoloration as well, where almost orange and brown like in appearance. But with that being said, um, it is harmless, but it's just something to be aware of. And dyskinesias, like I said, um, this may entail a dosage decrease in the levodopa by your physician. Next, I'm going to be talking about the anticholinergics. So with this one, um, it's postulated or believed to how it works is to balance the cholinergic and dopaminergic activity. So essentially, you know, in our brain, we have different types of neurotransmitters, so different chemicals in our brain that work in different, yeah, neurotransmitters. So it's just chemicals that work in the brain. And in this case, cholinergic um, relates to the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, whereas dopaminergic relates to dopamine. So in this case, um, if there's an imbalance, it can pretty much bring about the Parkinson's symptoms, right? So in this case, or in this case, movement concerns. So when you're trying to balance that out, um, that's what they believe may help with reducing the tremor by ba balancing out that activity. So some examples would be trihexaphenidyl and benztropine. Um, often with the anticholinergics though, they are used to treat tremor possibly in younger individuals. So the reason for that is because of their side effect profile. So some side effects with the anticholinergics is they found that you may experience some dry mouth, blurred vision, urinary retention, constipation, drowsiness. But the big concerns with the anticholinergics and the reason why they're often not recommended for use in older individuals is because it can cause confusion as well as cause memory, impairment, memory impairment. So it just affects the memory. So that's why often they are used for tremor in younger individuals. Um, the last class that I will be talking about today is amantadine. So it's part of the, it's an NMDA receptor antagonist. So going back to what I explained before, in this case, um, I, yeah, I want to add that, you know, sometimes we want an antagonist and it, antagonists not, aren't essentially bad things. It just really depends on the situation. Sometimes we want to antagonize a receptor for their desired effect. So this is, would be the case of that. So with the mantidine, um, the mechanism of action is unclear, but how it's believed to work is to increase dopamine release and inhibit dopamine reuptake. So often in this case, it is the mantidine is used to help reduce dyskinesia. So in some cases, a mantidine might be tried in individuals who experience dyskinesia, who might have, you know, the neurologist, movement disorder specialists have tried managing their dyskinesia by maybe, you know, decreasing their levodopa dose and increasing the frequency or how often it's taken, but that hasn't been that successful. They might add amantadine to their therapy to hopefully see if it can help reduce their dyskinesia, for example. Some side effects with amantadine are um, confusion. So it's their side effect profile is similar to anti, they have anticholinergic side effects. So possible um, confusion, um, insomnia in this case, some people, I, you know, possible uh, dizziness, hallucinations, ankle edema, so that swelling or levito reticular. So what levito reticularis is, is a discoloration, like a purplish reddish, Discolor discoloration of the skin. It may look um, lattice-like or net-like in appearance, and it can occur, occur on the legs. Um, so it's just something to monitor for. Generally, it is, it is harmless and reversible, but it's something that you would, you know, of course, if you experience it, it would something that you would bring up to the attention of the physician. Um, going back, sorry, to the ankle edema, in cases where there is swelling and just accumulation of fluid in the area, then often that will lead to discontinuation because obviously that side effect is one of those things where, 
you know, it can limit treatment. It's one of those things that will just, yeah, not, not something that the doctor would want you to continue often in most cases. Um, but with that being said, yeah, those are the possible side effects of amantadine. So to go to our take home, with the take home is dopamine agonists and MALB inhibitors, they can also be used to treat the motor symptoms. So it's not just levodopa, right? These ones, depending on just your symptoms and possibly the severity of the symptoms, they might be more appropriate options for you after discussion with a neurologist or movement disorder specialist. The different classes of medications um, also, you can see that they each have a unique mechanism of action, and when you combine certain classes together, they can help manage your PD symptoms. But I think what it also highlights is no two people are alike when it comes to Parkinson's. Um, with, from my experience in talking to different individuals with Parkinson's and looking at their drug regimen, you know, no two people truly are alike. And it really does highlight the importance of the medication regimen being tailored to you and your needs and where you are in the disease. So um, it's going to be a topic that I'll be covering in webinar number three in medication management on Friday, June 26th from 2 to 3 p.m. So essentially with that um, webinar, I'm going to be doing just a quick run through again of all the medications. And then I'm going to go into just how to go about managing the medications, um, things to watch out for, certain types of combinations that you might see and when to take your medications. And I'll, I'll have um, sample patient cases as well. For individuals that um, were in Victoria, I actually presented this presentation in Victoria at the regional conference, but for the webinar, I did make some changes to it, a little bit of additions and just a little bit of um, adjustments to the presentation. So um, yeah, if you could join for that, it hopefully I will, I believe that will be helpful just because you can see that with the different medications and the different regimens and with people experiencing wearing off, it's just one of those things where you really have to start kind of looking at what you're doing from your day to day and looking at the type of documentation you're doing and just seeing which factors might affect um, how long it takes to kick in or if you're experiencing insomnia and having trouble sleeping at night like what we can do and just shifting the medications earlier and how to go about that because sometimes people will ask me oh can i take this medication with this medication and if you know we just we'll, we'll be discussing things like that for the next webinar so um yeah please tune in and that is my presentation um thank you so much